very delighted to be here and um, just excited to talk about the thing that I love most, <laughs> which is labyrinths. And um, World Labyrinth Day coming up, I thought it would be great to look at what I consider the quickest and easiest way to make a walkable labyrinth, which might not be what you expect. The first thing that I learned about labyrinths was the classical labyrinth seed pattern. Uh, I found it online while I was Googling. And um, that's the way that I began to, to draw labyrinths on paper. And then I lived um, by the beach. And so I would go out onto the sand and I would use the seed pattern to draw uh, the labyrinth at low tide and um, experience it that way. And then I took my first workshop with Robert Ferre at Grace Cathedral, um, maybe four or five years later. And uh, he also uh, taught the seed pattern and uh, literally taught it with seeds and beans and lentils and uh, all sorts of things. And um, oh, here's my, my actual uh, seed pattern uh, classical labyrinth. Um, that I made at my first workshop. This was 2010 in the basement of Grace Cathedral. So I always say that, you know, to anybody who's sitting out there at, in a desk or at your table, you know, in this workshop, you know, I was once where you are now. I once sat at the beginner's table uh, in the back of the room and um, just feel blessed to now uh, be sharing what I've learned in the last 10 years um, to you. And who knows, in 10 years, maybe you'll be the one uh, in the spotlight, and I hope you will. Um, so Robert also taught about other ways to draw the classical labyrinth. So you can draw the classical labyrinth with the seed pattern, and you can also draw the classical labyrinth with concentric circles. And that's how you create the medieval labyrinth, especially the Chart labyrinth um, with concentric circles. But there was one thing he said, he said, you know, I can draw, I can create a walkable labyrinth in less than uh, 10 minutes. And I was like, what, he can do that in less than 10 minutes? And he said, yeah, and uh, it's a different technique with a stand-up tape machine. And uh, the workshop ended and I was like, Robert, we gotta see this labyrinth in less than 10 minutes. And, uh, you know, most people had actually left and it was one of those kind of, if you kind of just linger around and, and wait to see what kind of emerges after, you know, after the main uh, presentation and you get the kind of the behind the scenes, uh, Robert pulled out this tape machine and uh, created a giant spiral in the back of the classroom and then uh, demonstrated how you can convert a spiral into a seven circuit classical labyrinth. And I was like, whoa i mean it was beyond me at the time and i didn't even attempt it for maybe five years but it planted a seed in my mind that there's many different you know entry points into this form and then i was uh attending tls annual gatherings and i went to one in waycross indiana where tom vetter um, did a workshop and he is just like Robert Ferre, a genius in terms of tools and techniques. And he, in his workshop, he also showed um, how to create a, uh, a spiral and he used a precision technique and uh, his own uh, tool to create this chalk spiral. And again, it was like, oh, I, I, it kind of like planted another seed or maybe watered the seed that had been planted by Robert but I didn't do anything with it. You know, it's one of those things where it's like, it has to emerge like three or four times for it to really take root. And then I was online searching again about spiral labyrinths. And I found this article by Thorne Stiefel and it was in the Labyrinth Pathways um, journal, but he posted it on his website. And um, he showed that not only can you create a seven circuit classical labyrinth from a spiral, but you can also create five and three circuit classical labyrinths from a spiral. This really sealed the deal for me because I was falling in love with five and three circuit labyrinths because I felt to really understand the form of the labyrinth, I needed to really get down to the basic, to the smallest 
simplest form of what a labyrinth was. So I was, I was really into three circuit labyrinths. And when I found out that you could create a, um, a three circuit labyrinth from a spiral, I was like, all right, now I'm ready. Now I'm ready to give it a try. So I decided that it would be my goal to create a walkable labyrinth in less than one minute. But ultimately labyrinths aren't about goals, they're more about intentions. And my intention for learning and perfecting this technique was to create a walkable labyrinth with the simple and quickest method using everyday materials. And these labyrinths are really great for introducing new people to the archetype because they're so simple. And they're great for festivals or monthly art walks, World Labyrinth Day, and they are good in small spaces or if you have a limited budget or materials. And what's cool about the spiral technique is that when you draw a classical labyrinth from a seed pattern, I think that's the best way to draw it on paper. So this technique is, I feel, the best way to create it full size in a space, walkable. Um, so if you're leading a workshop or you, you know, you know, I think I don't, I'm not discrediting the seed pattern. I think the seed pattern is really great for drawing, but for walkable labyrinths, what's great about this technique is that it starts in the center. If you've ever drawn the seed pattern, you'll notice that the center of the seed is not the center of the labyrinth. And so if you're trying to create a classical labyrinth in a room and you draw your seed pattern, it's very hard to gauge where to put your seed to fill the space of the room because it's about a one third from the edge. But what the spiral does is you start in the center of the space and then you spiral your way out. And the next great thing about this technique is that you don't even have to know how many circuits you're gonna create when you start. You can just begin creating circuits round and round and round and just make as many circuits as you have materials or you can fill your space or whatever. And you just need to make a minimum of four loops. So, you know, if you start your spiral and you go up over and around, you know, when you come back around and you actually have a pathway, then that's a circuit, right? So that's one loop. And if you can make four loops, then you can create the three circuit classical. But if you have room or materials for more, you can make up, you know, whatever. So like in this example, I made seven loops, right? The next thing you do is from the tail end of your spiral that you created, right? This is my tail. You draw a line going up four circuits through back to where your center is. And then on either side of that line of four, you're gonna make a line of two. One on this side, that's kind of the indented side where the spiral is one loop in. And then another on the other side on the right. And then you're gonna create two dots on the other sides, the outer sides of those lines of two. And then this is going to create your 180 degree turns around those dots, your line ends. And then you just erase the lines between the vertical lines that you drew. And that creates the labyrinth. That's it. It's done. And I'm going to, I'm going to lead you drawing through this in a second. So I'm just giving you an overview of what this looks like right now. And if you have a pencil and paper and an eraser, <laughs> you need an eraser. And uh, we, can, we can draw this together in, in a second. But I just wanna show you how this looks. And what actually you've drawn here is a uh, chakra vayu labyrinth, which is a classical variation with a spiral center. So this is a three circuit classical with a spiral center that then becomes what is called a chakra vayu labyrinth from India. Now, here's the next great thing about this technique. If you want a larger center, you know, you can just erase your center spiral and make a larger center. Um, and so it's quickly adaptable, right? And it actually, if you erase that spiral center all the way back to where you 
drew that vertical line, this is your three circuit classical labyrinth, the simplest form, but it's an archetypal labyrinth. This is, this is half of the seven circuit labyrinth, which is the oldest labyrinth in the world that goes back four to 6,000 years. So, um, you know, this has all the qualities of a labyrinth in my opinion. Now, if you only have room or materials and you'd make just your four loops, then what you do is you simply draw your line all the way from your tail to your center tail. And then you put your lines of two on either side and it's symmetrical, right? They're on the same circuits. And then your dots, and then you erase and you create your three circuit lab la classical labyrinth straight like that. It is a little wonky in the center and that's one of the drawbacks. Like everything has a benefit and a drawback. The drawback of this technique is that it becomes a little uneven here, but this is something that you can quickly um, even out you know, if you're working with tape or stones or something else. And I'll show you also how to do that in a second. So now I'm going to stop this and I welcome you to pull out your paper. You know, the beauty about this recording is that you can uh, pause and rewind and go at your own pace. But some people, this is gonna be very straightforward. And, you know, if you've taken summer school with me before, you've probably already done this. And for those that already are familiar with design, I mean, with this approach, let me um, whet your appetite for part, the second half of this <laughs> uh, presentation, because I have now done something I've never done before with this approach, which is use it on a double spiral to make a processional classical labyrinth. And I have a great really incredible story from yesterday that will also be worth your time. Okay, so if you're drawing along with me at home, you know, you want to put your pencil in the center of the paper. You could also use small objects, you know, if you have a tabletop and you, you are drawing a verse, you could use, you know, coins or rocks or something or lentils or <laughs> rice or what have you as well. And you, um, I find it easiest to count and to draw by going up over and around, you know, for my first loop. It kind of looks like an ear. And this is probably the hardest part of drawing the spiral is just getting a feel for this. And you may have to do it several times. You may have to, you know, just like anything, you may have to erase, you know, you might just want to draw a bunch of spirals over and over again before you start creating your, your labyrinth. But once you get a feel for it, you go up, around, and over like a ear, and then you want to continue. And now you're making your pathway, right? And you want this to be consistent as best as possible, um, because most labyrinths have consistent pathways. And you're just now just keeping, you're just following around. And uh, here, one, two, three, four, five. Now I've actually already gone five loops here. And you can count them, you know, it's the spaces in between, one, two, three, four, five. The spaces in between your tails is your, is your counting, your circuits. But I have a little more space, so I'm just gonna keep looping around. Okay. If you're doing this at home, it's easiest if you end up at the bottom of your page so that your tail and your, your inner tail and your outer tail are in a line. So the next step is to draw from the outside in. You want to go up four circuits, one, two, three, four, right? And then on the right, well, on the left, there's like a step and you go up two. And then on the right, you go up to, and then you're gonna draw your dot and your dot. And then that's where you wanna be. And so it's a line of four, two lines of two, 
and two dots, right? And then you're gonna erase the three lines in between those two vertical lines. Well, you have three vertical lines, right? You're gonna erase the three lines between those three vertical lines. There's three lines, right? And then you're gonna erase the line between the dot and the line. And that's it, you're done. And you've created your chakra labyrinth. And you know you can test it and you can see it goes in and it meanders out and it comes all the way to the outside and then finds its way back and then spirals to the center. Now, you could also do this counterclockwise with your spiral, but nothing really changes except then it's going to be a right handed labyrinth that enters into the right. And then this clockwise spiral enters into the left, right? Like that. You can also draw this from the outside in. You can spiral on the outside and spiral your way in. If you had limited materials and you wanted to create a large center, then you could start on the outside and loop your way in. And you can also play around with erasing your center to open it up, you know, and see what it might be like to have a larger center and less of a spiral. And again, if you erase this all the way, then you're going to end up with your three circuit classical labyrinth. Now, I said this is a little uneven. So what you could do is actually erase this kind of corner and you could here um, even this out a little bit. And if you have rocks or whatever, you could also even round these turns and get rid of all the angles. And then that would be a little more flowy like that. And then it's looking, was looking really good. <laughs> so, all right. So that is drawing your um, chakra value if you have lots of loops. Now, what if you only make four loops? One two, three, four, right? If you only have four loops, then you have to connect your line all the way from the outside to the inside. The other variation you can do is instead of making these lines parallel is you can make them go um, diagonal somewhat like that if you wanna create kind of a wider entrance. And it kind of creates a different look. I call this kind of like a keyhole effect. Kind of ends up looking like a keyhole. Okay, so I'm gonna stop sharing now. And again, be patient with yourself, you know. It may come quick and easy, or it may take time. I didn't say this was the quick and easy learning <laughs> how to draw a labyrinth. It's the quick and easy way to make a labyrinth. So, um, but I do guarantee once you get a hang of it, a hand for it, it will be create labyrinths quick and easy. All right, so now I want to um, show you, Robert created this labyrinth in, in five minutes, right? And I've actually been trying to get it down to one minute. <laughs> it's kind of like also born out of necessity because I used to do these art walks where every month there was a, uh, a walk in my community and sometimes I'd be running late. And, um, you know, if you have an event, you know, it's good to have something up your sleeve where things aren't working out. And, um, you know, you need to create a labyrinth as quickly and efficiently as possible. And this is using a stand up tape machine. So this is actually a tool that 
um, Robert Frey created using a hand tape applicator that you would seal a box with. And he um, took the handle off it and attached a painter's pole to it and switched the wheels around so you can actually go forward instead of pulling it away from you. And, you know, in, in the labyrinth world, passing the torch is really passing the tape machine down from generation to generation. So Robert uh, really blessed me with this stand-up tape machine that he uh, created himself in his workshop. And it works great because you don't have to bend over so much and break your back, which, you know, as Robert got older, he realized that, you know, he would uh, benefit more and more from inventing tools where he could stay standing up to create a labyrinth. Um, now you see I'm taking my tape and I'm making a line of four with my tape and then a line of two. And tape is my favorite material for uh, creating temporary labyrinths. Um, tape is super forgiving. Uh, you know, if you mess up, you can easily just start over or fix it. You know, I would not recommend using paint <laughs> if you're a beginner. And you actually can't use paint really well with this technique because you need to be able to erase. So this is not really something you want to use. Um, but you could use chalk. And I'll, and I'll show you an image of a chalk labyrinth doing this just have a sponge or a rag with some water ready. And there you go. So the Chakra Vayu Labyrinth. And this is what it looked like after I added a little squiggly line around the perimeter. You know, I feel like the medieval shark labyrinth shouldn't have all the fun with uh, the lunations. So sometimes I give this little squiggle to the outside of my labyrinths just to add a sense of, of a containment to the space. And then we also put these lanterns at the entrance and at the center, and then little LED lights all the way around, which are really cool. Uh, this is at Labyrinth Summer School in Stony Point, New York. And you can see another, sometimes I use different colored tape. Um, you can get tape at different stores, comes in different colors. Um, the most common is blue. And, uh, you know, if you're doing this on a carpet or a wood floor, you do want to test and make sure that your, you know, a hard sticking tape can pull up varnish on a wood floor. Um, but tape is rated for different residue levels. And so blue painter's tape is the safest because it has the lowest residue. But they do sell low residue tapes in other colors, like the purple is even lower residue than blue. But then it will have a harder time sticking and won't hold the turns as well. Uh, and this is with a, two rolls of tape on a, on a um, stand-up tape roller. I put two rolls of tape next to each other and then it kind of created a cool like uh, gap in between the pieces of tape. So two tapes next to each other and it looks really sharp. It looks like, you know, it doesn't even look like a tape labyrinth necessarily. And then I also love flagging ribbon. So if you're gonna create this on grass or um, a soft surface, um, I use this uh, flagging ribbon that they use in landscaping to kind of mark trees usually that are gonna be cut down. And I use landscape staples. And so then again, I do the same process where I create a spiral out of uh, landscaping ribbon with staples and then I open it up. And this is at Veritas Summer School in Canuga. Uh, North Carolina. And you can see this spiral is a little jagged because, you know, when you're doing this freehand, uh, it creates this kind of jagged, but that's just another look. Uh, the flow, the flowiness is not as, as much, but uh, it kind of looks more graphic. And here's another one. This is at Veritas Summer School in New Harmony, Indiana. So hopefully we will be back in New Harmony uh, next summer. Uh, this summer, we're gonna do Veritas Summer School online again. 
Now here is a uh, three circuit classical made from a spiral with chalk. And you can see I erased um, the spirals with a sponge. You can still kind of see where they got erased. And if you're using colored chalk, it doesn't erase as good as white chalk. So if you really want a clean look, you just use white chalk, it'll erase better. The colored chalk can use a leave, leave, leave a little bit of um, pigment. But you know, I dressed it up a little bit again. I, I did the squiggle line around the outside. I made a spiral in the center. I even made some dots on the line ends uh, just to give it a little flare. Uh, if you want to make a precision spiral, you know, and you're having trouble doing a freehand one, this was a technique that we actually came up with at summer school, which is kind of fun because people throw in different ideas. And you can see um, that Chuck Hunter and Anel Tanner are in the center there. And we created this thing like a hockey stick where uh, it was a, a broken yardstick attached to a longer yardstick, a double yardstick. And it had one piece of tape, you know, at the joint where the, the, the hockey stick bends. And then we had another piece of tape at the end. And basically the, the taper would then just follow the end of the stick around like a rabbit around the racetrack. And uh, that just helped kind of give a sense of keeping your, your path widths uh, consistent, so. And then this is uh, what Tom Vetter uh, created and demonstrated at the TLS gathering in um, New Harmony, which is if you want to make a very precise spiral, if you put two stakes in the ground, or if you have, like he's put two screws into two pieces of wood and then two weights, and then you wrap a rope around the screws, um, then as you unwind the rope, if it's attached to something, or you can just use the end of the rope as your guide, you can follow that around and create a precision spiral. And the trick is that the, or the trick, but the uh, insight is that the distance, the, the measurement between the two screws times two is gonna be your path width. So if those screws are one foot apart, then this path width is gonna be two feet. Oh, here's actually the video of, of uh, that's not Tom actually using uh, the tool. Tom's over there on the right. But this shows, um, there's Tom. I think he's with us in the chat room today if you'd like to yeah, chat him up guys. about his <laughs> technique and tool. Um, so you can see as it unwinds, it's creating a different uh, radius point for um, the spiral as it unwraps itself from those you can two screws. You can, you, this way you can do a labyrinth really quick. You don't ah, see, he says, he says, this way you can do a labyrinth really quick. And I was like, oh. Well, actually, you have to lay those out ahead of time. Okay. But, uh, now, then you know where to stop. the other thing you can use is a can or a round object, and you can wrap your string around that. And instead of Tom's technique, this is the tomato technique where I've used tomato can and um, just like a 25 ounce can of crushed tomatoes and uh, use that to um, make my swivel point. So now this is getting a little advanced and I don't wanna like overwhelm people that are just seeing this for the first time. You know, if you're just doing this for the first time and, and you wanna keep it simple, then just do it freehand and practice drawing on paper first, doing it freehand. And then, you know, as you build experience and confidence, then you can try to create the precision labyrinth. For some people, maybe using a center, you know, stakes or um, center can or um, bucket or something will be an easier way. So I don't know what's easiest for you. I actually find it easiest to do it freehand. I, I struggle with the precision techniques, uh, but I wanted to show you what it's like. And what's cool that I just discovered is that I used to wrap the center like, like so many times. In fact, one time at Veritas Summer School, we actually wrapped a person <laughs> with, with the rope and we did it so many times they could almost have trouble breathing. But you don't need to wrap the center like 25, 40 times. You only need to 
tie a string or a rope from your center to the edge of your space, because that's as far as you're going to unwind, right? And then you can wrap your string around your center, and you can actually see as you wrap it how many loops it's going to make. And so it actually gives you a little preview. So you can see I'm kind of using my string to see that I'm centered in my space. And then I'm wrapping it around. And you see it wrapped around five times. So I know that I can make five loops on my spiral. And then, because I know not everybody has tape machines, and I'll, I'll tell you about tape machines a little bit more. That's usually the number one question people have. Is where, do you, where do you get the tape machine? Um, but if you don't have a tape machine, don't fret. You can just uh, use your hands. <laughs> It is going to be a little more of a workout because you're going to have to either squat or uh, kneel. And what you're doing is you're following the end of your string with your tape and unwrapping it from the center. And you can see the, the problem that often happens is that your center can move around because you pull too hard on it. Like this tomato can does not weigh a lot. So um, you have to be mindful that your center doesn't. Uh, get pulled off and the heavier the object the better so somebody in uh one of my workshops had a can full of gravel that was really heavy and worked really great now this is also a very challenging um uh example because the space is so tight but i want to show you that you can you know use this technique in tight spaces, it's especially valuable because, you know, laying out a, a seed pattern in a tight space like this would be really difficult. But laying out a spiral in a tight space like this is actually not too hard. So there you go. So there's my spiral. And this video is also on my YouTube channel. So um, you can you can review some of these videos individually if you go to YouTube and search Discover Labyrinths. And now you can see what I'm going to do is the same approach again, where I'm going to create a line of four across and then two lines of two on either side. And then I'm going to pull up the tape. And you want to make sure that your tape is contrasty to what your floor is. So, you know, if you know that you're going to have a workshop and you have blue painter's tape, but then you go and visit and your carpet is blue, then you're going to have blue painter's tape on a blue floor. So you may want to carry multiple colors of tape, which actually I usually do. So then I can like look and see like, oh, I'm going to use orange here. I'm going to use blue here. Um, you know, you can, you want high contrast between your, your tape and your floor surface. It's also useful, pro tip, it's also useful if you have a touch knife or um, some sort of uh, pointy object, or maybe you have long fingernails, but that's what I'm going to go get actually is a touch knife to help um, get the tape up off the floor because you know it can be hard to peel the tape up and break it off of the surface. So a little knife or um, something that you can slip under there and free it uh, will help it out a lot. You know, if you want extra wide line ins, you can make those wider to give people more space to turn around in. And there you go. Now, this is funny. I want to show you, you can also use objects. Um, you don't have to do this with tape or chalk or ribbon. Um, I did this with my laundry. And uh, so you can freehand a spiral with anything. I mean, you could use rocks. Um, I used laundry and uh, this was in the height of COVID where you, you couldn't even really feel safe to go outside. But uh, so you just take your objects, right? And you put them in a spiral. And um, 
It's a little more difficult with long objects like this, like clothes, uh, because when you move one piece, you're gonna lose like a whole line of your, or part, a big segment of your spiral. Uh, but I just wanted to show you, you know, another application or use of this technique, this method. And I don't have hardly any space here at all. So I'm only gonna be able to make four, um, four loops, which is gonna allow for just a three circuit um, classical. And, you know, I had to fudge it a little bit, like, don't worry. Maybe you have to move in one of your spirals in order to fit yourself into the space. So there you go, there's my spiral. And now this time I'm just gonna connect my outer line to my inner line using the materials I already have. So, um, you know, if you have stones or whatever that you're using to make your labyrinth, you can just use the stones that you're pulling up and use those to form your vertical lines. So it's actually the same amount of material. So if you use up all your stones to create your spiral, um, the same amount of stones that you're gonna pull out to open up the pathways is the same that you're gonna use to make your vertical lines. And there you go, there's the laundry labyrinth. Ta-da! All right, well, we're running out of time, but now this is the, the bonus for the, the experienced labyrinth makers or anybody that's really, you know, gung-ho. And it also is, is um, uh, practical because of COVID and the pandemic. Um, processional labyrinths have become really um, valuable because in a processional labyrinth, you walk one way through and you don't have to turn around and retrace your steps and come face to face with other people. And so I have a whole YouTube video about design considerations for the pandemic, which is another video that you can find. But I wanted to show you that you could use this technique, which I've never done before, for a processional uh, classical using the double spiral. And when you create the double spiral, you then use this technique on both sides. And when you do it on both sides, then it creates this um, processional with the double spiral center, which is really cool. And you can form your double spirals in two ways. And you can either make half circles, you know, you make one half circle going in one direction, and then you're making the other half circle on the other direction, kind of like a circle if it got shifted along its one axis, right? And then you're basically just making concentric half circles uh, around those small circles that you created, the center of your double spiral. This is advanced technique, so, you know, but it's fun to watch, you know, and something that I've just begun doing myself. I have to mute it though, because I'm grunting too much. There we go. And I actually, you can see that I, I put out little measurements with pieces of tape. So because this was such a tight space, I actually measured it out and I needed 11 path widths. So I, I put little blue pieces of tape to mark out 11 segments across the room. But otherwise, I'm just eyeballing it between those, those little hash marks that I made. So this is kind of like a semi-precise um, technique. <laughs> you have to press down hard on your tape in order for it to hold the turns. And the tighter the turn, the tighter you have to press down on it. Also, the thicker the tape, you know, if it's an inch and a half tape, it's going to take the turns. Um, it's going to have a harder time taking the turns. So thinner tape is going to do turns better, right? 
but it's going to be more feeble. And wide tape is going to look more graphic, like a labyrinth, like, you know, two inch line. So it'll make it bold, but it's going to be harder on the turns. You know, this was ripping a lot when I was doing it. And then I went around and I um, stepped on it to really, uh, you know, you, you could go back around and step on it all to kind of um, reinforce it. And, uh, you know, this actually lasts for a few months outside. I put one of these blue tape labyrinths in my backyard for a workshop and it, it survived for like three months. Even though it was just blue painter's tape, I couldn't believe how long it lasted. So you could even make like a semi-permanent labyrinth for like three months. I guess it depends on your climate and, but it rained out there on it and it still survived. You can see I did the angles and there you go. Boom. So pretty nice, huh? Processional, uh, double spiral, three circuit, classical labyrinth. Now, this is the fun, fun story from yesterday. So I actually went out because I wanted to create a precise double spiral labyrinth, but I failed and I could not do it because I couldn't, I couldn't find enough weight for my center. I didn't want to carry all this weight over to the park to make my center. So my center kept moving around. I had to pull the whole thing up and throw it in the trash, but I decided to freehand it. So this is me freehanding a double spiral, um, which I'd never done before. And uh, it just shows you a different technique for, for drawing the double spiral. Basically you create one spiral with a super wide, like a super big spiral with a double wide pathway, right? And I'm using my stand-up tape machine. And I just ran it until my tape ran out, boom. That, that's the end of one roll. And then I put a new roll of tape on my stand-up tape machine. Obviously I've uh, put this in fast high-speed motion. I'm not actually going this fast. But then uh, I started from the center and now creating the second spiral within the first spiral. And there you go. And um, so this would be great for World Labyrinth Day this is more difficult, but if you were up to it, you could try to create this double spiral processional labyrinth, you know, for World Labyrinth Day. Or if you're just beginning, you know, just go for the single, um, you know, the, the, the first half of this lecture. And what's cool about this technique is if it only takes you, you know, 10 minutes or half an hour to make a labyrinth, why not make four labyrinths? And then for the pandemic, people can have different labyrinths to walk. You know, there can be four labyrinths instead of just one. And that would create more spaces for people to walk labyrinths on World Labyrinth Day. Now, this is pretty cool. You see this guy coming up in the corner? So at this point, he comes up and he says, hey, what are you doing out here? I said, oh, I'm working on an art project. And he said, what organization are you with? And I said, uh, I'm just an uh, individual. He said, oh, I'm the head of this art center next door. I said, oh, I'm sorry, don't worry about it. You know, this is a temporary art project. I'll pull it up when I'm done. He said, okay, that's fine. And I said, you know what a labyrinth is? He said, what, what is it all about? And I said, well, it's a, it's a path for meditation or prayer. It's, uh, you know, people to let go of stress. And as he's walking away, he said, you know what? you should just leave it. Maybe some kids will enjoy walking it, you know, from the neighborhood. He said, let me give you my card. And uh, I said, I'm making this video for, an, for my online class. And he said, I wanna see your video, this will be great. So it was incredible. I made this labyrinth, really like almost the second that I finished building it, he shows up. And I know from previous experience, if someone questions you about what you're doing in a public space, just say you're making a, a personal art project <laughs> and that it's temporary. But the more he learned about it, I mean, at first I thought I was getting in trouble, but the more he learned about it, the more he got excited. And, um, and now, I don't know, he said, he said, are you gonna paint it? And I said, no, 
you know, but you could, you could paint it. So maybe, maybe I'll actually create a permanent labyrinth here, you know, for my little neighborhood. Now you can see I'm making my squiggle lines and actually yesterday I realized that I could use the uh, tape to round out those corners. So not only am I doing the squiggle line around the perimeter, but I'm also uh, doing the, the squiggle line through the entrance and around the, um, the turns. And uh, I ran out of tape, but this is the finished uh, labyrinth. And I had to use a little bit of green tape instead of orange on the outer uh, last little bit of the lunations, but it was really fun. And, you know, I couldn't believe that that guy came over. I, I really assumed that I was gonna be scolded for messing up this, uh, <laughs> putting all this tape out in the park but it was really reassuring and and I'll I'll find that happens often when you build a labyrinth almost the second you finish building it usually somebody will arrive right right when you're finishing and that's like the most reassuring thing so before we go I wanted to share a little bit more about the taping machines because a lot of people ask about them and this is a closer look at the one that my uh, mentor Robert Ferrey uh, created using a hand tape roller and a painter's pole. And you could simply attach a hand roller to a long arm painter's pole, but what he did is actually switched the wheels of where the tape and the um, appl application wheel are, and that way you can roll forward and not just back. Now, if you don't wanna build your own, then you can buy a pre-made one, and this is one by a company called Tool Lab, in the Midwest, and this one costs about $45, but unfortunately the shipping ends up being around $20 to $40 itself, so it ends up being around $80. But maybe if you live close to them in the Midwest, it would be cheaper. And there's another company that I just saw this morning called Zip Up, and uh, they also sell them, but uh, for around $80 plus shipping, which might be like 20 bucks. So it'd be like a $100 investment. Uh, for a pre-made stand-up tape machine. There are other tape machines on uh, Amazon or at Walmart or places, and they have two handles, but they're really not um, very useful, um, and they have two wheels, makes it hard to do the turns. So I, if you're looking for other ones, I would suggest one with a single handle and a single wheel, not, not the other way around. And lastly, I wanted to share that you can put the turns in other places. You don't have to just use this method um, to create a three circuit classical variation. Um, you can also create a five circuit or even a seven circuit classical labyrinth, depending on how you uh, expand those entrance turns. And I cover that in my uh, more online in-depth workshops. Um, but you can also see it on uh, my Discover Labyrinths YouTube channel as well. And then uh, Tom Vetter shared this example of an incredible labyrinth that he made using the spiral technique. And he put in really much larger turns and created a very complex uh, labyrinth using this simple method. So, you know, if you really get inspired, you can play with putting turns in other ways. Uh, Tom also created this more simple version where he just put in turns on the quadrant, on the axis, kind of like a medieval approach instead of having them all at the entrance like a classical design. So have fun. Uh, good luck with your pop-up labyrinths. I'd love to see them. If you want to email me, you can email me your, uh, your creations to findlars at gmail.com. That's F-I-N-D-L-A-R-S at gmail.com. Also, if you have questions, uh, feel free to email me a question. Uh, if you're looking for a handout with the um, uh, written instructions on how to make a, a labyrinth from a spiral, then um, you can go on my website to the uh, workshops link and you can find the link to this recording and also the link to the PDF handout on my website, discoverlabyrinths.com. So peace on your path and the journey is yours. Bye-bye.